For my first climb review, I chose Rundlestone. It's a climb I know well, and it's long, meaning there's quite a lot to talk about. From the right-hand turn, it's 9.51 kilometers to the top, climbing 353 meters at an average gradient of 3.7%. It's a long climb for the area, and it's quite scenic, especially near the top, which means it features as number 11 on Simon Warren's official 100 UK climbs. The official segment starts later than the turn, probably because of these cars, but also to make the statistics look slightly more impressive. The official segment starts at the bottom of this little dip and is 8.7 kilometers long, climbing 350 meters at an average gradient of 4% and a maximum gradient of about 14%. I think the first segment is perhaps the more useful one because most people start the climb from the center of Tavistock. You can join from either of the two small roads on the right, but I think they're quite narrow and quite steep downhill. Looking at the Strava segments for the two, which are both in the description of this video, they're both within 100 attempts of 21,500 total attempts, meaning most people, I think, do climb it from the bottom. If you look to the right just here, you can see a small stone marking the edge of the National Park. If you look closely, you can read the name of the park from the flat panel on the front of the stone. The climb can be broken up into four parts. This first part, from Tavistock to Moorshop, is 1.7 kilometers long at an average gradient of 3.8%. Hidden within that, as you can see, are these steeper ramps and flatter sections, meaning it's more of a lumpy staircase. The next section we'll get to is Pork Hill. After that, there's a flatter section with a downhill into Merivale, and from Merivale to the summit is the final steeper section. Here's a Devon and Cornwall Police 4x4 off-road vehicle. Perfect for the Dartmoor terrain. You wouldn't find one of these in London. The climb features in stage two of this year's Tour of Britain, which is why I wanted to share this video. Stage two is a lumpy 184 kilometers from Sherford to Exeter and Devon, which will likely be won by a breakaway or from a reduced bunch sprint. The climb has been used twice before in the Tour of Britain, the first of which was in 2010. This stage, stage number five, was from Tavistock to Glasby and was won by Marco Fraporti ahead of Bradley Wiggins. Michael Albacini was in the leader's jersey. This crossroads marks the start of the second part of the climb, Pork Hill. This section is two kilometres long at 7.6%, meaning it would be a pretty good fourth category climb if it wasn't connected to the rest of the climb. More recently, in 2012, the Tour of Britain used it in the penultimate stage, Stage 7 from Barnstable to Dartmouth. The climb is called Merivale after the hamlet near the top. Jonathan Tin and Locke of Enduro Racing took the leader's yellow jersey on this stage and held it until the end of the race, but this was stripped in 2014 for biological passport anomalies and given to Nathan Haas of Garmin Sharp. This is the steepest section of the climb. On screen it says 13%, but on the OS map, it has a chevron suggesting at least 14%, and on the Strava segments, it suggests maybe 14 to 15%. The climb also features on the long route of the Dartmoor Classic Sportive, a local sportive organised by the Mid Devon Cycling Club. The origins of the name Pork Hill are unknown, but legendary Dartmoor suggests it's because it's a pig of a hill. This is probably not the best time to overtake the other cyclist. Now on Strava, both the long and official segments have the same KOM and QRM. The KOM is held by Andrew Feather, renowned hill climb specialist, and the QRM is held by Connie McLaughlin, a local junior racer. For the long segment, Andrew Feather rode the climb in a time of 18 minutes 48, and Connie in a time of 25.42. I wonder if the Tour of Britain is going to set a faster time. Simon Yates set a time of 20 minutes and 16 seconds when he rode the climb during the 2012 Tour of Britain. This would have been the KOM, except that the segment hadn't been created yet. As we reach the top of Pork Hill, there is a viewpoint on the car park to the right. This has great views over the Tamar Valley to Cornwall. You can see some of these views by looking over to your right shoulder. This third section of the climb is flat, and slightly downhill as we enter Merivale. As you can see from the footage, this part of the climb is very scenic. I've labelled some of Dartmoor's tours, outcrops of exposed granite that protrude above the surrounding moorland. Vixen Tour is visible from the road. It's privately owned and one of the few Dartmoor tours that is inaccessible to the public. 
you can also see Kings Tor, around which the bed of the old Princetown to Yelverton railway snakes, and North Hessery Tor, which has the television aerial. The line opened in 1883 largely to serve the Princetown prison, but also to serve quarries around Kings Tor and on Walkhampton Common. The bed of the railway is now a cycle path, although it's unpaved and largely just gravel. On the left of the road is Maryvale Quarry. It opened in 1875 and stone was taken down to Tavistock Railway Station by horse and car. The quarry closed in 1997. As we descend here, we enter the hamlet of Maryvale. The name Maryvale has two potential origins. The first is in old documents in which it is listed as Mirafield and potentially has been corrupted over time. The second potential origin of the word is from the Cornish word Mara, which means market. This would make it Mara Vale, market in the Vale. This could be from the plague era, when the area around Mara Vale was used by the market to escape the pollution of Tavistock Centre. The road we're on is the B3357. Between 1887 and 1889, the road was straightened at Mara Vale. You can see the old road still in front of these houses. This would have been part of the 1772 toll road from Tavistock to Exeter via Morton Hampstead. It would probably have been a track before this dating back to prehistoric times though. In 1957 and 8 the modern bridge and embankment were constructed to further straighten the road. This was constructed using the stone from the local quarry. The old bridge is still visible down to the left of this bridge. If you're cycling up this climb and you look to the right you'll be able to see the Merivale stone rows. These sets of stones are possibly a prehistoric solar calendar because if you stand in a certain spot the stones will line up with the setting sun on the horizon. Alternatively, it could just be aliens. There are also hut circles, stone circles and cairns nearby indicating that this area may have had some religious significance to the people in the prehistoric times. If you want to find out more about this history of these stones and how they've been changed over time, I recommend reading the Merivale Complex article by Legendary Dartmoor. I've linked it in the description. If you want to ride this climb, Tavistock is an obvious place to base. A 30 km loop starting from Tavistock would be to climb up Rundlestone, drop to Princetown and then down to Walkhampton, Horrorbridge, then taking Jordan Lane up and then descending back into Tavistock. Another scenic loop is to go 80 kilometres starting in Tavistock and following the road up Randallstone then onto the B3212 to Morton Hampstead. From there you climb up to Wooden Down and then down to De Oakhampton, taking the cycle path back down towards Tavistock. It's really scenic and the cycle path is lovely even if a short part of it is unfinished. Plymouth is also a reasonably close place if you wanted to ride from, as is Exeter. Although extra you do have to ride about 120 km loop. This could involve following the old A30 up to the 80 km loop in Oakhampton, Tavistock and Morton Hampstead. Or you could go across from Morton Hampstead, then a loop round Princetown up Rundlestone and go back over Dartmeet and Widdicombe for a tough 3000 meters elevation gain. In terms of rating the climb, I broke it down into five categories. Firstly, the length. It's quite a long climb, so I gave it a 9 out of 10. For the gradient, it's diverse with some steep sections and some flatter sections and a little descent, meaning I gave it an 8 out of 10. The surface is a bit rough, but there's no large potholes, so that's a 6 out of 10. As for the traffic, it's fairly busy, but not excessively, and the speed limit's fairly slow at 40 miles an hour, so I think it's a 6 out of 10. Not forgetting the sheep, of course. The scenery is great, and I gave it a 9 out of 10. Combining these scores, where length, gradient and scenery count as double, I gave this an 8 out of 10, meaning it's a pretty nice climb.